Good evening. How are you? Well, it rained too much today, and yesterday I got in very late from uh, doing Ari's show on the vice president testifying before the grand jury. And I've had several thoughts about things that have been happening recently. Uh, you probably have heard a variety of songs by Bob Dylan, and there's so many that without referencing a particular one, you might not know what I'm talking about. But he has a particularly strong song that he wrote in the 60s, and it was about Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy from Chicago, and he went to Mississippi. And while he was there, he went into a store where Carolyn Bryant was. Now, Carolyn Bryant just died in the last couple of days. She's 88 years of age. But at the time, she was obviously much younger, because this was back in the 50s. I think it was 1955. And what happened was our boy, Emmett Till, a young boy, was black. And Carolyn Bryant was a white woman in a highly prejudiced and bigoted environment. And people said at the time that he came on to her, this 14-year-old boy. And it turns out that there's been a lot of recanting of testimony since, and that that was not the case. But like all tragedies where we have discrimination and problems of race, these kinds of truths don't bear out the situation. So they kidnapped this 14-year-old boy, and they took him to a place, and they beat him so bad, and he was disfigured terribly, and he was kept in an open casket. And if you want to have the feeling of this tragedy, of this depression, of this cruel behavior, you should listen to Bob Dylan's song. But the story rings within us anyhow because of discrimination in this country, racism in this country, rejuvenated, if that's the right word, under Trump, and raising its ugly head every day. John Lewis great civil rights lawyer, beaten himself, fighting for equal rights for people. But as a young man, as a kid, he got the talk like other persons of color did. And it was about being careful about police and about people and so forth. And he said that Emmett Till was his George Floyd, that it rang true with him and gave him fear for what could happen to him, despite the courage he showed as a civil libertarian in the years of his own life. So what do we have here? Well, some could say, oh, well, maybe he did do something, but nothing he could have done would have justified disfiguring him and killing him. And they had him in an open casket so others could feel terrible about it. Look Magazine, however, interviewed the two people who were tried and who were acquitted for the murder and kidnapping of Emmett Till. And these two men appeared in Look Magazine and under the theory of double jeopardy, they admitted that they'd done it. They'd been acquitted. They were free and clear. Now in these days, if you were looking for acts that would resonate with this nation's need to seal off the poisons that were released in this kind of hideous assassination on a young man. If we had an attorney general like Robert Kennedy, within the days when his since recanted accuser has died, if we had an attorney general like Bobby Kennedy, we would do something to honor this young man. We would declare him innocent of these claims, and at the very least say that he had been brutally murdered by a bunch of bigots. There are many ways to give an accounting. Shame may not be the effective ones we've learned with Trump, but it is one of them. Remembering a person who suffered on behalf of civil rights and liberty is another. Prosecuting any of these people 
that would have been good if you could bring it to conclusion in a just society rather than one with all white members of the jury bigoted voting to acquit the people who committed the murder that they felt comfortable with. So that's my uh, thinking about Emmett Till. I find it to be a distressing thing. Some of us can remember the first time we came across bigotry and racism. I never really considered it until, as a young man, I was in an apartment in the South Bronx, and I was with a couple of other kids, and the mother came to me and said that she was going to ask us all to leave, but we could come back afterwards if we didn't come back with Stevie. Stevie was my black friend. We ran together. We lifted weights together. We hung out <laughs> on uh, fire escapes and uh, got in a little trouble that way. That's the first time I realized that they didn't want Stevie there because he was a person of color, because he was black. Everybody has their story. It's like the other things in American history that are terrible. We remember certain things. So how is this alive and well with us today, this kind of bigotry? And the answer is, as recently as in the last couple of days, VMI, Virginia Military Institute, has a new leader in town. And he has said, DEI is dead. And you know what that stands for? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Don't expect us to encourage or protect diversity. Don't you expect to be equal, to have justice, to have equity, and don't expect to be included. That's really something for a military school to be teaching when among our notions about fighting is to fight to protect certain rights and liberties. And here, a person of color is really told, you're not work welcome at VMI, and we're not going to give you these basic protections. Pretty terrible. Like I said uh, last night when I got back too late uh, from being on Ari Melber's show, we were talking about what was genuinely breaking news, historic news, that Pence, the vice, former vice president of the United States, was summoned to the grand jury. Now, he fought the subpoena at first, and the court said that he couldn't be asked questions about anything going on on January the 6th, because at that moment when he was at the Senate, he was for all purposes a legislator, and he earned the right to invoke the speech and debate clause, which means you can't ask people, go beyond that, can't compromise it. Interesting. Now, my view about any right or privilege is that it takes flight when it's abused and misused. And I don't think the words that may have been had on that day between the president and the vice president about how to overturn the election was protected in any way by speech or debate. I don't believe crime can be protected by speech and debate. I don't believe a vice president and occasional presence in the legislative body, by that fact alone, has protections of speech and debate. And some say that the case has been more carefully examined and that maybe some information was obtained. But if I were the vice president of the United States, of course, I wouldn't have the views of Pence. How many people who care about society, care about our Constitution, care about our laws, could be Pence. He, he seems to not respect the rights. One of the things he said publicly in recent days is that he thought what Trump said was reckless, not that it was criminal, not that it was inciting people to riot, including threats to the vice president himself, to hang him because he wouldn't do what Trump wanted him to do. Talk about a hybrid profile of courage and cowardice, of patriotism and traitorship. A man who looks so clean and white, more so than seems possible. I'd compare him to Gaffigan, the comic, who's always making fun of how white his body is. But he did testify. And 
What he testified about could set dates and times when conversations and meetings occurred about Trump's efforts, which were stated quite publicly, that he wanted the vice president to basically roll over the House and the Senate sitting in joint session to decide and count the electors' votes to determine that Biden was the president, but their hope was to change that by having Pence decide that there was a legal objection and there should be research on that subject. It's quite a sinister thing when we take the departments and distort them in this way. So, Pence testified for hours, and we don't know what questions were asked. The grand jury is secret. Some of it may be said. The witnesses can always talk about it. Uh, if there's a fight or an argument about what Pence withheld and refused to answer, that could be a courtroom battle. might even be public. We might find out about it that way. But here's the final chapter in question about all of this. Uh, it was a king who was asked what he thought about Gibbons, who wrote The Rise and Fall of uh, Rome. And uh, when the king was asked about his writing, he said, scribble, scribble, scribble. Scribble, scribble, scribble. Well, what if a prosecutor only questions, 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 and never charges, charges, charges? We have an attorney general who seems to have used, I like to call him Blackjack Smith, because I think if he actually prosecutes, that'll be a, a number, a name that sticks to him. But if he doesn't go forward, Blackjack Smith will be how we ridicule him, that he didn't have the wherewithal, the guts to overcome the censorship of the attorney general, that he couldn't go forward with any charges, that perhaps... Garland, our attorney general, said, hey, you know, we're getting close to the election. And my view is stated on Ari's show, and what I believe, and I know others believe it as well, is how can you defer to a man running for office now when the greatest crime that you're researching, and this is in the history of America, is that this man tried to interfere in the last election, presidential election, to overthrow it after the result was in, in which he plainly lost. So he wanted to steal the election he lost to Biden and give it to himself in violation of law, in contradiction of the facts that were at hand, meaning there was no fraud found, not any, that would justify doing what they were doing in the House and the Senate. And we hear in recent days these leaders, so-called, in our legislature, who led the charge, the most dramatic one has been Cruz of late because of tape recordings that he had with Fox. So these are a couple of things I had in my mind. Uh, we can't seem to get straight tolerance and equity among our people. And we have this sin that began at the origin of this nation, and we just can't get around it. In recent days, I was in Charlottesville on a, uh, a special operation we had talking about solar power. And on the way back, we had to drive past Jefferson's home. And we did. Uh, we, we stopped there. And uh, we got a very good tour. And uh, the difference between Jefferson writing in the Declaration of Independence about equality and having and keeping slaves until after his death. It tells us that even the founders of our country couldn't reconcile the biases and prejudices and the peculiar institution, as they call slavery, with the promise of America, which is that we're equal and free and represented in a government. We have by inches and sometimes by leaps redressed our original sin and made advances. But we're in a special place now and not just about race in which our institutions are being assailed by the worst of our people, by those who seek power, not right behavior, who break every law that they can to do whatever they can. And 
We are lucky that we have courts that are responding. We are lucky that we have some people with courage rather than cowardice who are prosecuting these cases. And I think this is the vector that will bring us back, reform government as it is, and restore the republic that we once were. So I'm not going to turn around in place, <laughs> and I hope tomorrow uh, to see you as I walk outside where it's not raining. All the best. Nice to be with you. Have a good evening.